Welcome to Map Time. Uh, we're good. It's, I'm happy to see everyone arriving. Uh, this is your weekly uh, Map Time chat series. So I'm David Weimer from the Harvard Map Collection. This is a series we're co-hosting with the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. Um, and we're really excited to have uh, people interested in maps and mapping. And we talk with different people um, that work with maps, that do research with maps, that work in map libraries, just about a map or a set of maps that they think are interesting um, and, and what we can learn about them. So today we'll be talking with uh, Ray Clemens, who's the curator of early books and manuscripts at the Beinecke uh, Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University. Yeah, he's the co-author co of Introduction to Manuscript Studies and the editor of a book on the, the Voynich Manuscript. Um, so without further ado, I will bring him on. We're just waiting to see if he can connect. Um, we'll be talking about uh, the Vinland map, which is a notorious map uh, that Ray will be able to tell us more about. Uh, it's been the object of study for um, a good 70 years. There we go. Captain. Hi, Ray. Hi, how are you, David? Good, good. How are you? Good, thanks. Sorry, I hadn't enabled something, so it went through several loops before I was able to actually see you. Don't worry. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Um, it's exciting. Yeah. So, um, tell us about uh, the Vinland map. What, uh, what's hovering behind me? <laughs> yeah, it, it hovers around me as well. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the Vinland map is, uh, if I can start it this way, is a forgery. It's a 20th century forgery um, that has had sort of an outsized influence um, in, in many different ways. Uh, some, of those, some of those quite negative, some of them um, you know, less negative and more, more irrelevant. Um, it, uh, we don't know who forged it. Um, one of the map's best interpreters, a woman named uh, Kristen, uh, sorry, Kirsten Seaver, uh, suggested um, an author, but we don't really know who authored it. It, it, it sort of comes out of this black hole. Um, and the first time we know that it appeared was in 1957, um, when it was presented at the British Library. Um, we don't know if the British Library was offered the map or not. Um, there's, there's really no correspondence about that. Um, we do know that uh, in the early 1960s, it was uh, offered to uh, Yale to purchase. Um, and uh, Paul Mellon, the sort of famous uh, philanthropist, uh, offered to pay for the map as long as it could be authenticated, which made a lot of sense. There was a tremendous interest in exploration of uh, the Americas uh, in the 1960s. And uh, this map, if authentic, would be the earliest depiction uh, on a map of the New World. Um, and so immensely uh, important in that sense. Um, there are all other historical things that would have been interesting had it been a real map. It would have been the first time um, Iceland uh, and Greenland as well had appeared on a map. Um, so it had several things that, that would have been important had it been general, had it been uh, authentic. Um, what the way in which Yale chose to authenticate the map was it had three individuals write a book, a rather massive book, um, called uh, the Vidal Map and the Tartar Relation. And the three people that um, 
wrote in the book uh, was the uh, curator, sorry, the keeper of maps uh, at the British Library, uh, R.A. Skelton, a very famous cartographer. Um, interestingly, not a manuscript person, but uh, a man named Painter, who was uh, the incunables uh, keeper at the British Library, and then Thomas Marston, who was the Renaissance uh, curator uh, at the uh, Yale Library. This was before the binding key itself existed. Um, Thomas Marston wasn't a paleographer. He wasn't a manuscript specialist, um, but uh, he had worked for a long time with uh, medieval manuscripts and um, was a very good curator in terms of uh, taking care of Yale's collections. In 1965, they produced this massive work that authenticates uh, the map. Um, and uh, on Columbus Day Eve, I know that that's probably not a holiday for real, um, but the uh, the day before Columbus Day, uh, which ironically is called Leaf Era Day, um, Yale announces that they have uh, the first map um, depicting the arrival of Europeans um, in the Americas. Uh, at the time, New Haven was uh, and is still uh, hugely populated by Italian Americans. Um, and there were, I don't want to say there were riots, but there were certainly protests uh, that took place. People were furious um, that. Uh, Yale was claiming that someone before Columbus had arrived uh, in the Americas, um, and they saw this as denigrating um, Columbus's achievement. Um, and believe it or not, uh, so senators uh, got involved uh, with this. It actually was was a very big um, controversy. But from the moment it was it was announced, uh, really uh, 1966, there started to be questions about its authenticity. Um, there, there wasn't another map like it. It doesn't look like most world maps that we see. So um, I know it's hard for you guys to see the map itself. Um, and, and there are two reasons for that. One of them is that the, the map is very uh, done in a very light ink, um, which is unusual for an iron gall ink. Iron gall inks are generally very, very dark. The map that you're actually looking at has been um, uh, photoshopped so that its contrast is really high. If you were to see the map itself, it'd be very, it's very difficult to make out the actual lines uh, along the map. Um, in terms of what's depicted, is, uh, it's a map by uh, Andrea Bianco and uh, a map from 1461, uh, his world map. And then uh, if you can follow along the very top of it, thank you. Um, so this is a uh, facsimile um, uh, that was done in the 19th century of um, of, uh, sorry, in the 18th century, uh, that was done of Andre Bianco's map. And uh, you can see it is for the 15th century, a, a European, uh, sorry, a world map, uh, meaning it has uh, Europe, uh, Africa, and Asia uh, represented there. Um, and um, what has happened is, is that the author of the Vinland map has taken uh, this facsimile uh, and um, copied it uh, onto an open bifolio, uh, and then has added to the to the outside of that uh, Iceland, Greenland, and uh, Vinland, which is um, the islands. Uh, it's it's not an island, obviously. It's a, a, a Newfoundland, um, and I don't know if you can see that, but to the very top and left side uh, of the map. Um, those uh, three islands are uh, Greenland, Iceland, and uh, Vinland, um, as it were. And then uh, even more difficult to tell above that is a very long inscription that confuses um, Leif Erikson and uh, two other explorers and invents a bishop uh, that apparently somebody thought had gone to Vinland. So it's got a little history in there as well, uh, which again would have made this a, a very uh, valuable map. But if you follow the very top of the map, you'll notice that there's a, the sort of, I don't know how to do this in, 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 in Instagram, but if you look at the very top of the map, you'll notice that Andre Bianco's map is meant to, to show you at the top of a, of a globe. And what's happened is, is that they, he simply added these additional islands uh, to the outside of it. So he's taken that map and um, added those islands. So it's very clear that this is not a map that was composed sort of in toto. Uh, if, if it had been those, you know, you would, have, you would have broadened out the top of the map so that you could have been included those. 
Um, and, and David, don't let me go on too long. I don't know how long you'd like me to, to talk before no, no. doing questions. Uh, no, that's great. And, uh, you know, one of the, it's a good description of, of what's happening there. It's kind of, uh, we've got some islands tacked on uh, to a kind of elongated uh, map of Mundi. And kind of what, one thing in case readers aren't as familiar with the map of Mundi, the, the Bianco map is oriented with east at the top. Um, and so you can see the Straits of Gibraltar there is what is the reference point I always give people uh, down there toward the bottom. And then uh, the Vinland map is uh, rotated. So it's more like uh, a modern world map as we might expect it with north at the top. Um, the... David, that's a one observation. Most world maps are done with east at the top. Um, this was the Jerusalem was thought to be the sort of center of the world and east was thought to be where the world was sort of created from. I know that sounds like a bizarre thing, but paradise was supposed to be at the very eastern uh, most port. So, so you're right. I mean, it's sort of unusual to have a map where uh, north is in fact depicted at the top. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you mentioned the uh, the kind of somewhat outsized influence of the Finland map. I'm, I'm curious what, um, why, why you think that so much analysis has gone into this map, um, and kind of what the allure of the uh, the binary question of forgery is like there's a I think there's a certain allure to the sense of like well we can prove this is or is not a forgery and I guess I, how you think about that in the context of of the other manuscripts you have in the collection and and kind of what why this has gotten so much attention um that's that's to me the heart of it is um I, I can see why originally there was this great sort of interest, although we have their archaeological um, digs that had shown that the, the Norsemen had in fact been in Newfoundland. Um, you know, so we know conclusively that that happened. We didn't really need a map um, uh, to prove that. Uh, but what's interesting is you're right, it, it lands with this kind of thud and it creates anger. I mean, people are passionate about uh, the map in a way that other forgeries don't seem to inspire that sort of anger. Um, and the other thing it inspires that really interests me is longevity. So um, 1966, the first uh, you know, questions were brought up about the map. 1972, um, a, a group called McCronin Associates who are uh, scientists in Chicago did analysis of the ink. Um, and with the analysis they were able to do in 1972, they said it's a modern ink. So in 1973, uh, Yale admits that the map is a forgery. Um, and they even start to talk to Charles Witten, who is one of the booksellers that sold it to Yale about getting their money back. Uh, and Witten is kind of this classic shadowy figure. And he, he says, well, I, you know, we spent all the money and then the European bookseller has the rest. And, um, you know, he's basically suit proof is, is essentially what he claimed. Um, so 1973, Yale says, it's a forgery. Uh, you know, it's enough with the historical things that we found, we, they didn't have any provenance for the map. Um, and so, you know, they, they announced that. And yet, um, continuously through the 80s, the 90s, uh, last, last year, uh, we did our own analysis of the map. Um, people, they're just not convinced. Um, they, they, for some reason, hold on to this, that it has to be genuine. And so they come up with reasons why the science doesn't work. Um, sort of like the Shroud of Turin, where they, they carbon date the shroud, they find out it's a 14th century shroud, um, and they then have to say, well, you know, if Jesus is really resurrected and it, maybe it changes the carbon dating of the, <laughs> the object nearby. Um, we don't have anything quite that interesting for the Vinland map, but for example, for a long time, people argued that uh, there were contaminants that fell on the map. Mm -hmm. That, that Macron uh, had, had seen, or they, they had an entirely different way of preparing manuscripts where um, the, the thing that's in, in the modern ink is called uh, anatase, uh, titanium dioxide. And uh, what Macron found was a modern form of it, meaning a commercially produced form of it. But anatase occurs in the environment, particularly in sand. And so there was a group of historians that thought that part of the process of making a manuscript was to help the ink dry. You put sand on top of the manuscript, like a blotter or something, uh, and then blew that off. Um, I've never found sand in a manuscript in my life. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Um, 
but yeah, actually, it's, it's something I'd love to hear more from you and, and even from the people that are here. Uh, the, the passion, as I said, um, we, we did our own tests in 2018. Uh, Richard Hark, uh, the Yale's uh, Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage, and we, what we did was we used um, XRF, X-ray fluorescence, to not just test one point in the ink, but they did it as a matrix. Mm -hmm. So we looked at the entire map, every single you know, pixel, <laughs> every single tiny element that we could. And the only place we found anatase was where there was ink, right? It literally lit up just like uh, the map itself. Um, but we still, we had a, a little conference in 2018 and we had people uh, who said, no, no, we had, we had still gotten this wrong had we considered you know, X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So why, why this forgery? Um, and why maps in general? Why do we find so many uh, forged maps? Uh, is it their value? Is it their graphic nature? Um, you know, what is it about maps in particular that people are drawn yeah. to forge them? Um, and the, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, if, I, if, if my sources are correct, it sounds like Yale is, is actively collecting map forgeries. Uh, and I guess I wonder what you think the, the research value is and kind of how um, of collecting forgeries and what kind of an, what kind of history you can write as you collect forgeries and, and, uh, and have a collection of those. You're right, actually, that um, I, in, in particular, my, and my colleagues, actually, in, in other areas of the Beinecke have also been very interested. Uh, for example, uh, my colleague, Catherine James, looks at literary forgeries. Um, so the people that were uh, imitating Shakespeare's hand uh, and pr producing Shakespeare documents, uh, William Henry Ireland, uh, she's been very interested in that. Um, in the medieval period, the, the value isn't as high for texts as it is for things like maps. And so, um, and particularly in the 16th century. So we've collected uh, the Waldseemuller Mueller uh, map gores that were um, announced two or three years ago as being, you know, the third set of map gores. And Waldseemuller, Mueller, like Vinland, is famous because he's the first person to print America, a map. Um, and before the action, auction took place, uh, people online, uh, just using online analysis, were able to show that this was a, a fake. Um, and it probably doesn't tell us a whole lot about the Middle Ages, but it does tell us a lot about how uh, people in the 20th century think about the Middle Ages and the early modern periods. Um, and clearly the, the value, um, this, these Valsi Miller Gores, they, they thought we're gonna bring in uh, a million pounds. Um, and so there's, there's obviously the, you know, the, the financial component. Um, but yeah, what we hope to learn is uh, some of the methods of the forgers so we can figure out how they do it. Um, we were, were fascinated by uh, why uh, they're interested. Are there things beyond just the uh, monetary value um, that they're trying to get with those? So those are all questions we have about. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, it sounds like Yale does a, a lot, um, or at least in the, in the grand scheme of things, a, um, a good amount of multispectral imaging and kind of XRF uh, analysis. And I'm, I'm curious what, yeah. what you see as the advantage and limitations of that technology and also what, what you're kind of, uh, either what you're planning on doing as soon as you can, you know, be on, on campus doing that kind of analysis and, and what, you, what your dreams are for, for using it. So um, one of the things that we're doing is we've got a, a fairly large project that is examining all of the Portland maps uh, that are in our collections. Um, and for uh, people that don't know what Portland maps are, they are uh, maps that were made beginning in the 13th century. And uh, they were supposed to be seafaring maps where people uh, were able to navigate the Mediterranean uh, and then eventually um, the Atlantic. And then as, as uh, the world expands um, Africa, uh, the Atlantic and the Pacific along the coast of Africa and the, and the New World. Um, and like the Vinland map, a lot of uh, these uh, Portland maps came into American collections in the 1950s and 60s. They were, uh, they're big, they're, they're an entire uh, calf size. Um, they're very colorful. They have all sorts of wonderful drawings on them. They're recognizable. 
uh, as, a, as an item. And so they, they fit well on people's mantles. Um, they made nice hangings. Um, and uh, what we're curious about was um, we knew that we had one that was forged. Um, and the way that we could tell primarily was it, it simply didn't look like the rest of them. And then we did XRF. We did this elemental analysis to tell what was in the inks. And for example, Prussian blue uh, was sort of your standard modern uh, color. And there was Prussian blue everywhere uh, on these maps. Um, and so what we're doing is we're now going through our entire collection to see, um, is that an anomaly? Is it just you know one map that happened to be collected? Or um, was this more widespread? Uh, was this something where, not, not necessarily for profit, uh, but perhaps a tourist market or uh, you know some other market where the original purchaser knew uh, that this was something made in the 20th century, but as that object gets inherited and passed down, um, those, those uh, chains of information break. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one of the things we're, we're hoping to do with it is to discover, um, you know, are there more forgeries in the collection? And then the other thing, the nice thing about XRF is it, it tells us what the, what, what the components are uh, mm -hmm. in the pigment uh, that are being used. And um, these Portland maps, as uh, particularly the Jews were expulsed from Spain, uh, they traveled uh, through uh, off of Egypt and uh, then to Palestine. And one of the things we're looking at uh, maps from Palestine and to see do they use the same inks and pigments that those same map makers had used when they were in Europe, or do they you know, find new recipes, new supplies, that sort of thing. Yeah, well, that's interesting. And for people that, um, that are familiar, I think if I'm correct, XRF works by shooting light at the map and then the dispersion of that light based on how it's reflected from different minerals tells you what the makeup is. Is that correct? Yeah, um, XRF, the, the beam that's being sent is an x-ray. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, you know, light, it's a yeah. slower, you know, uh, and what it does is it causes a sympathetic vibration. Mm -hmm. um, and so each of the, the molecules uh, will vibrate at a different rate. And uh, what it does is it bounces off the surface uh, and then we have a receiver um, and it's able to measure uh, those vibrations. Mm -hmm. And so it can tell us what is in an ink. Its limitation is, is that it can't tell us their proportions. Okay. So uh, it will tell it it's a binary. Uh, it's either there or it's not there, but it can't tell us how much of anything is there. Mm -hmm. And that's why things like uh, saying that there's contamination is possible. So, you know, one part per million, it's still there and your binary will, will find it. Um, but, uh, you know, if we had known it was one part per billion, then we would have said, oh, it's just a contamination. Um, so it, it's a little bit limited. On the other hand, it does no harm to the object. Um, it doesn't put x-rays on there that are any greater than the background uh, radiation uh, would be. It's just that it's focused at a particular wavelength. Yeah. Um, and we have one question that's come in that uh, is similar to what I was asking before that, um, you know, why... Why any? Why do you guys? Why have you guys chosen to do more research on the the Vinland to to verify something that um, I think that the majority of us already uh, already agree with? Um, and then, kind of what what are you not examining because you've you've uh, chosen to do the the Vinland uh, or focus on the Vinland in that respect? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, we, you know, we have limited resources in, in terms of uh, time and uh, equipment and why continue to look at a map that we, that we, we believe uh, was a forgery. And, um, and honestly, one of the reasons, was, reasons um, was that we were trying to figure out a little bit more about how the forgery took place. Um, so for example, in addition to testing the, uh, the pigments, which was a fairly easy test to do, the other thing we did was we did um, mass peptide fingerprinting to try to determine, as you can see from the map behind you, it's actually two slices of parchment that have been put together. Um, and we wanted to know if they were from the same animal uh, or not. That is, did they get both of these from uh, the, the same book or you know, from somewhere else and, and put them together? So there were a lot of questions we thought we could answer at once. Um, and then the other reason was, was that we saw this as an opportunity to bring um, this kind of research uh, to, a, to a larger audience. 
So a lot of people don't, don't know these sort of forensic techniques. And we were hoping to find something that was a hook. And because the Vinland map already had so much uh, notoriety, it was sort of uh, an obvious example to be able to go and say, well, you know, if you're interested, these are the reasons. Um, and this is the way the technology has grown since the 1970s when we last did the ink analysis or the 1980s when we did it. Um, I hope we didn't leave important things aside, but you know, we, we, we may have. Um, as I said, we have several projects uh, going at the same time, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a valid question. Um, and I don't know if our investments necessarily paid off, but so far, for example, when we've presented this at conferences, people are still very, very interested. Uh, so there does seem to be, even though we're, people are mostly convinced it's a fake, there still does seem to be residual interest in the, the map as an object. Yeah, no, and I like that as a, as a way of explaining that, that it's, it is a good way of showing a large audience what kind of analysis is possible um, and kind of hooking them with, with the villain. But actually what, what's interesting is not so much the results about forgery or not forgery, but the methods and, and the kind of stuff you can learn with those tools. Um, the, and is it two animals? So I, we don't have the results of the, okay. of that yet. Um, so that's still uh, that's to be announced, not in a yeah. spectacular way. Um, we're 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 pretty sure it's from two different animals, um, but we don't yet know. Yeah, um, and it'd be interesting, you know, that to say, you know, look at other uh, other books, right, and say how many animals are in this book. Uh, uh, so I think that's uh, an interesting, interesting question. Um, but I never really thought about it. You know, I thought about, uh, yeah, how many is it? Is it always going to be the least number of animals that make up a, a set of um, a set of uh, you know a vellum book, or is it going to be um, kind of what's it on hand? Does that make sense? Like so, so, like you, you could have a book, right, or have a set of um, vellum or parchment pages that um, that you know, you're taking what you can from a set of animals and and making it right away, or you could have um, you know taking it from a whole bunch of different sources. So it's many different animals uh, that are going to many different books, rather than like one set of animals that are dedicated for just this one project, if that makes sense. No, it, it does. That, that way I understand it entirely. Um, and, and these are questions that, you know, we, we haven't even begun to explore because we haven't had that information. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, it sort of works the other way around too, which is um, we're learning a lot about uh, the practice of animal husbandry and where different animals, calves and sheep in particular, uh, how they were bred, how their, uh, how their materials were sold. Um, and, and we are finding that, as you know, one of your, your primary questions indicates, um, that like anything else, they start fairly early on uh, manufacturing this uh, for, for export and for, for uh, a decent you know, uh, size circulation. And it isn't really kind of a local thing where you've got you know, five cows that are raised particularly for this. It really is pretty advanced, at least by the 12th century. Yeah. Um, the uh, other thing we learn about this is that these animals were slaughtered fairly young, um, yeah. that they're not, parchment isn't a byproduct of slaughter, but is the primary reason uh, to slaughter these animals. Interesting. Well, that's really fascinating. Um, the, I, I, like, I like to think a lot about paper circulation, the kind of material circulation of rags and things that go into that. And so seeing that in the, in the earlier period is, is fascinating. Um, are there any other questions from our, our rabble rousers here? I don't, I don't see any, but, um, and we're coming up on the, on the half hour. So um, yeah, this has been really great. Thank you so much for coming. Um, oh, here we got one other question. A couple of questions, all right. Um, okay. So, oh yeah, so one is a comment that people who work on Anglo-Saxon and medieval Irish manuscripts have looked at these questions about vellum and cows. So um, it is a, a working, a working uh, area of research. And another question is, um, do the portal ends um, come to your collection as a group or 
Um, you know, are there subsets that came as a group or as a, an aggregation over over time? So this is, uh, and David will appreciate this as a curator, um, we don't really know when a lot of the materials <laughs> came yeah. to us. And that's sort of painful to admit, but um, for, for a lot, particularly of the mass, um, they, you know, we know that they're in after World War II, um, but then we had indications of their, of, you know, them existing at Yale until 1981 uh, when they're finally cataloged. Um, and so uh, we believe that they came in small groups. Um, you know, we can certainly say for a few of them that they came in, in you know, just one map at a time. Um, and they were probably uh, sought after, but we don't, we don't really have the kind of great provenance information that we'd like. And that's part of the reason that we're also interested in using these forensic analysis. Um, I don't know what Harvard collection is like, but you, you might have a similar collection where it's, it's really hard to tell where some of these came from. Certainly. Uh... Yeah, we don't have a lot of, a good, they're kind of, the portal ones are kind of, we don't, we have like maybe one in our collection and there's some over at, at Houghton, so they're, they're split a little bit. Um, but, uh, great. The, the people, uh, there was a question, no, Jackson, so Matt is uh, out of uh, Cambridge um, and he's been working on uh, these, the sort of materiality, the animals, mass peptide fingerprinting, DNA analysis. Um, and then sort of fun with the DNA stuff is, uh, the Folger is looking at the DNA in uh, books to see who's read them. Uh, apparently, every time you open up oh, a book, yeah. you shed your some of that. Yeah. Um, and that's a little bit scary on some level <laughs> to know that you've been recorded. Um, but they're hoping to be able to put together how often books are used and um, yeah. a little bit about their travel over time. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for coming. This has been really a very lovely conversation. And uh, yeah, stay safe out there. Thanks, you too, and thank you very much for the questions, and thank yeah. you, David.